Harshat Shmos reminds us that even in the darkest of times, there's always hope. The Israelites were enslaved for centuries, but they never gave up hope for deliverance. Their faith in God and their belief that redemption was coming kept them going, even in the face of brutal oppression. We must also hold on to hope and faith in the face of our own challenges. And Moses is an inspiration in this regard. Despite initially feeling inadequate and hesitant, he ultimately sped forward to lead the Israelites to freedom. We can learn from his example that even when we feel unsure of ourselves, we're capable of great things. When we trust in God's plan and have faith in our own abilities. So let's take inspiration from Parshat Shmot to strive to be like the Israelites, holding onto hope and faith in the face of adversity. Remember that even in the darkest times, God will always be with us to guide us through and guide us to freedom. Shabbat Shalom. So I actually didn't write that sermon. Well, I didn't plagiarize it, but I didn't exactly write it. Here's what happened. Someone already knows. Earlier this week, I went online to a new website that hosts an artificial intelligence program called ChatGPT. I logged in, and I typed into the request bar, hello, can you please write me a 150-word inspiring sermon about Parshat Shmot? And believe it or not, just five seconds later, I had exactly what I needed, an original sermon. My work was done. It's possible that some of you have also gone onto OpenAI in the last few weeks to play around with ChatGPT, or maybe you've read about it in the news. It's pretty amazing. You can ask ChatGPT to make you a shopping list based on a collection of recipes that you've planned for Shabbat dinner. You can ask it to write a complicated computer program for a new app that you're developing. You can even tell it to write you a review of a hit TV show in the literary style of William Shakespeare. It, it can do it all, and it can do it an endless number of tasks in just a matter of seconds. The computer program has been trained using large sets of conversational text. It actually understands how natural sentences are spoken and written and the types of emotions that they're meant to convey. And with all of this data being used to sophisticatedly train this speech model, the responses that ChatGPT can produce, they actually feel human. And if you weren't inspired by that sermon, remember, this is just the beginning. <laughs> In a way, these responses are human because they mirror our own emotions and they reflect them back to us. The Jewish artist and creator David Zvi Kalman writes that artificial intelligence like ChatGPT has to be a religious issue because these programs actually speak religious language. Religions care an awful lot about the form that religious arguments and ideas take, Kalman explains. And if that form is now effortlessly mimicable, if, for example, I can translate in and out of religious language as easily as I can translate between Chinese and Yiddish on Google Translate, then what does the language actually mean? Kalman explains, AI is nibbling at our notion of personhood and it's messing with our idea of sacred language. I too am curious and I'm honestly a bit concerned about AI, about what a world where computers can mimic our speech and our emotions might look like. And I'm concerned for three reasons. First, I worry about what this technology will do to the value of our own writing and our own speech. The internet has already created a world where there are more articles on any topic that you could possibly read and imagine. And not surprisingly, studies have shown that the more we read, our comprehension has not improved. The inundation of text and speech has actually made us more confused. Scrolling through texts on devices has robbed us of the space to sit still, to read, and to think deeply. So if original text will basically be free to produce and nearly unlimited, 
how will we ever really make sense of what's going on around us in the world? And second, I worry about how this technology will impact our ability to cooperate across groups of difference in civil society. Artificial intelligence flattens speech because it can make all text seem authoritative. And this deprives us of our usual means to fact check and confirm credibility. We know now that during the 2016 election, Russian operatives created Facebook groups promoting fake protests in an attempt to manufacture outrage and polarization. And if this same thing or something similar could be done by automated robots, the future of our civil dialogue or civic dialogue, at least in the near term, looks incredibly bleak. And third, I worry about the ways in which artificial intelligence will change our understanding of emotions themselves. Because what are emotions actually if they can be replicated by a computer model? Simply put, and there's nothing so simple about this technology, in a world of AI, where so much rating and speech that we do today could be automated, paradoxically, the way that we express emotions and communicate with each other will become of even higher value than they already are. This week's Parsha describes a moment in which the Israelites communicate in a novel way to change their destiny and to change the course of history. It's a moment where true humanity is recognized by God. And perhaps it's a model to shape our thinking in a world where speech deeply matters. The Parsha reads, this was the Shvi'i Aliyah, the seventh Aliyah that we read this morning. A long time after that, the king of Egypt died. V'yishma Elohim et nakatam, these poor Elohim et brito. The Israelites were groaning under their bondage and cried out. And their cry for help from the bondage rose up to God. God heard their moaning, and God remembered the covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. V'yar Elohim et b'nei Israel v'yada Elohim. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. This section of the Parsha comes suddenly and somewhat unexpectedly. Moses has just fled Egypt to live in Midian with his father-in-law. He's raising children with no intention to return. When the story shifts focus back to the Israelites in Egypt, we're told that God heard their nakatam, a groaning, <laughs> And that something about this particular sound and this particular moment helped God remember the covenant that had been made with the biblical ancestors. Why does God remember in this particular moment? Surely the Israelites had been suffering for hundreds of years before. So why now? Ramban, the 12th century sage living in Catalonia, suggests that before this moment, the Israelites were not ready to be redeemed. He explains that even though the 400-year period that God had decreed the Israelites would be enslaved, in Israel was now over, they were not yet fit to be redeemed. It was, however, only because this very cry that God received their prayer with compassion, that God no longer hid God's face from them, and God knew their pain. And Ramban bases his commentary off of an alternative version of the Exodus narrative. It's told in the book of Ezekiel. In this version, God was ready to free the people from Egypt, but they were unwilling to cast away the comforts and traditions that they'd become used to in Egypt. It's a provocative reading, because it suggests that for most of the enslavement in Egypt, the Israelites had lost touch with their ability to express their oppression, that suffering had become so commonplace that their cry that could be used to transcend had been lost. And the Hasidic teacher, the Sfat Emet, explains that until the king had died, the Israelites were so deeply sunk into exile that they couldn't even feel it. Now, with the king's death and with nothing changing, they became aware of their exile and they started to sound. The spot Emet continues that inside each of us, despite how enslaved we may be, there is a part of us 
that is free. There's a part of us that can stop. So what exactly is it inside of B'nai Israel that produces this particular type of moan after all of these years of suffering? How exactly did they break through the banality of their oppression to cry out in a way that would move God? I suppose we can't be exactly sure. But I think what is so essential is that deep within each of us, there's a range of emotions that can make God take notice. A cry that shifts history and changes the world. It's a cry that is novel by definition. Something that could not be replicated because it's unique to us. It could only be produced by us. So as we confront a future where emotions and texts can be automated, I think it will be a spiritual task of this century to figure out how we remain in touch with that crowd. The unique part of us that makes us most human. It will be our task to find that emotion in ourselves and very importantly to find it in each other so that we can continue to communicate who we are and how we feel. Of course, we already face this challenge in many respects to determine who we are pulling back barriers of social media and email and on and on. But when technology doesn't only obscure, obscure us, but it learns to speak like us, it will really then be up to us to find ways to stay in touch with our humanity. I imagine that if our words can be replicated, then this won't always be through words. It may be through the way that we show up for each other. It may be through the way that we sing together or sit in silence together. Like the Israelites, it may be through the way that we groan and we cry. In the very next chapter of the Parsha, God knows that just as the whales of the Israelites gain God's attention, Moses will also need to see a novel sign to gain his own attention, a sign that's just as provocative. So how does God respond to the Israelites' cry? God produces a burning bush. The bush that is ablaze, but is not consumed. And this is a symbol that Moses also simply cannot ignore. So through the cry and through the bush, God and the Israelites are communicating with each other, kind of playfully, back and forth. They're sharing their stories, they're sharing parts of themselves. We have to listen and speak in ways that cannot be automated. To find ways to be together, to hear each other, to understand each other's suffering, and to lift each other up. Chat GPT, it can write a sermon. It can do a lot of other things as well. But of course, it can't split the waters and lead us to freedom. Only we will be able to do that through our cries, our laughs, and the solidarity that we build. The redemption will not be automated. Yeah. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.